Hi, I'm Herb Gross, and welcome to the halfway point of our course in Gateways to Algebra, where we're going to have, I believe, 40 lectures, and we're doing lecture number 20 right now. And today's lecture is going to be on an introduction to what we call inverse functions. And it's really, again, something that we've been doing all along in this course, but we haven't referred to it by the name that most math books and mathematicians refer to it, and that's called the inverse function. And let's just talk about that a little bit. See, we've come to the stage where we said what? You have an input, a program, and an output. And that we said what? The input is usually denoted by x. The output is usually denoted by y. The program is usually denoted by f. And the way we would summarize this is y equals f of x. See, here's the input. It runs through the f program. The output is y. Now, that was arithmetic. What did we say algebra was? Algebra is when start, instead of starting with the input and finding the output based on the program, you start with the output and try to reconstruct the input. Well, if you notice, the program that you need to convert the output into the input is not exactly the same program that you got to use to get the output from the input. In other words, when you reverse these steps, that's what the mathematician calls the inverse program. So if f represents the program, f to the negative 1 power represents the uh, inverse. Now, I'll tell you why that comes about. Look what happens over here. Let's define a new type of multiplication. If you multiply two of these programs, it means that you simply make the output of one program the input of the next. So suppose I start with f. Here's the input. I run it through the f machine. I get an output. I now take that output and I run it back through the inverse program, what does that bring me back to? It brings me back to exactly what I started with. In other words, what this says is, if I compose the function and its inverse, whatever the input is, the output will be the same thing. And so in terms of what we call function multiplication, the inverse function undoes the function itself. Okay? So basically, what we're saying is, instead of saying, given the input, find the output, or find the output, given the output, find the input, we say what? Find the combination that will take the input and bring it all the way back to the input. Now, we've already done this. This may sound difficult, but we've already done this in some simple cases. For example, suppose we say, here's the input, add 3, now give us the output. Well, how would you do this? L let's not hang on to x's all the time. Let's just use u over here. If I start with u and I add 3, that's going to give me u plus 3. So the way I summarize this program is I say f of u equals u plus 3. What this says what? Is whatever the input is, the output is going to be 3 more. Now let's look at the inverse function. The inverse function says what? Once I have the output, when did I get the output? Wasn't that after I added the 3? So to undo adding the 3, I'm going to subtract the 3. So if f is the function that gives you 3 more than the input, what is the inverse function? The inverse function says whatever number you start with, you're going to subtract 3 from that. So the inverse of u plus 3 would be what? u minus 3. And that's another way of seeing why subtraction is the inverse of addition. Now, now watch what happens over here. Start with any number. Well, pick one just so it's more tangible. Add 3, right? So you say, say you pick 50. You add 3, that gives you 53. Now what do you do? Subtract 3. Doesn't that bring you right back to the 50? See, what we're saying is, what does f do? f says whatever the input is, add 3. Now, what does in f inverse say? It says whatever the input is, well, see, u plus 3 is going to be the input in this case. It says what? Subtract 3. And if you add 3 and then you subtract 3, doesn't that bring you right back to where you started from? So we've already done this. Here, let's look at another one. This one says input multiplied by 4 write the output. Well, how do you undo multiplying by 4? Starting with the output, since you got that after you multiplied by 4, you divide by 4. So basically, what this says is, if the function is multiplied by 4, what's the inverse function? Divide by 4. Well, if I pick any number and I multiply it by 4, then I take that answer and I divide it by 4, what's going to happen? The 4s will cancel and I'll come back to the same thing. Let's look at it from a tangible point of view. I'm going to start with 5 over here. I run it through this machine, the output is 20. Now I take the 20 as the input to the inverse function, 
run that through the divide by 4, and what happens? The 20 divided by 4 is 5, and therefore what? When I apply f and f inverse successively, I come back to what I started with. But all that really says is what? If we define the function to be the recipe that tells you how to get from the input to the output, all the inverse function is is the one that tells you how to get back from the output to the input. And we can put more than one step in at a time. For example, if this says input, multiply by 3, add 2, and that's then going to be the output, how do you reverse the steps over here? You got the output after you add a 2, so the next step is going to be what? Subtract 2. And when did you get this answer? After you multiplied by 3. So to undo this, you're going to divide by 3. So in other words, now, what's the in if, if the program is multiply by 3 and add 2, what's the inverse program? It's subtract 2 and divide by 3. See, let's do another problem that way. Suppose we started with 15 over here. We multiply by 3, that gives us 45, right? We add 2, that gives us 47. Now run that 47 through this machine, what do we do next? We subtract 2, gives us 45, then we divide by 3, that gives us 15. Doesn't that take us from where we started with right back to where we started? You see what happens? In other words, this is f. Reading this way is f inverse. And the way you summarize this is that f, if f is 3u plus 2, then f inverse is what? u minus 2 divided by 3. And, and by the way, you can get this just the way we've been working before. Suppose we never talked about functions and inverse functions. Suppose I said y equals 3x plus 2. Solve for x. The first thing we would have done is what? We would have subtracted 2 from both sides of the equation. That would have given us 3x. Now to get x by itself, we would divide by 3. But if we divide by 3 on one side, we also have to divide by 3 on the other side. Who cares whether you call this y or whether you call it u. All this says is what? Whatever you start with, whatever you name it, what are you going to do? Subtract 2 and divide by 3. So this might be a good place to pause for a minute to point out again the importance of language. Technically speaking, if you know the concept, who cares what the language is? The problem is that if the person who's communicating with you talks about a concept that you know, but in a language that you don't understand, you never know that you know that topic. So that's why it's very, very important to stay on top of the vocabulary. But look how simple things are from our point of view. Instead of talking about functions and inverse functions, what we're really talking about is what? A program that takes us from the input to the output. And what's the inverse function? The program you need to get back to the input once you know the output. And we're going to show what that means graphically in a minute, well, maybe two minutes, but whatever it is, you're going to see how easy the concept is geometrically. It's just the amount of work that we have to do in terms of the various functions and the algebra that's involved. And you see, uh, one of the uh, functions we're going to have to deal with is something called the square root function. You see, we've already talked about squaring. How do you undo squaring? To undo squaring, you take the square root. We've talked about raising a number to the third power. How do you undo raising a number to a third power? you extract the third root. And we're going to have to talk about things like that. So I just want you to become more familiar with some of these uh, special functions. And let's just talk about a few more and just see where it leads to. Suppose we have f of x equals the square root of x. By the way, something very interesting happens here right away. Right away, we know that x cannot be negative because we've already learned in this course that positive times positive is positive. So if the square root of x was positive, you see, uh, po in other words, if x is a positive number, uh, we get that by multiplying positive by positive. What's negative times negative? It's also positive. In other words, wh whether the number we're looking for is either positive or negative, the square of any number on the number line, if, see, if n is any number on the number line, n squared can never be negative. So you see, uh, the number which when multiplied by itself gives you x, this doesn't even make sense if x is negative, because no real number multiplied by itself will ever give you a negative number. But let's just go ahead and fool around with this for a while and see what it says. See, if the input is 0, what number multiplied by itself gives you 0? The answer is 0. What number multiplied by itself gives you 1? 
the answer is 1. Now, by the way, we just want numbers that we can see kind of easily right now. What if the input was 4? See, what number multiplied by itself gives you 4? That would be 2, wouldn't it? Okay? So if the input was 2, okay? And uh, if the input was 9, the output would be 3, right? If the input was 16, the output would be 4. But what if the input was 2? See, what you have to remember is, see, what, what, what is the square root of x? The square root of x is the number which, when multiplied by itself, gives you x. And let's just review what that looks like. For example, suppose I wanted the square root of 3. To find the square root of 3, I, wh what number am I looking for? It's the number which, when multiplied by itself, will give me 3. If my calculator has a square root sign on it, okay, then look what happens. I could just enter the 3, press the square root sign, and something like this would light up, 1.732, 0508, etc. And what that means is, if I were to take this number and square it, I should get 3. By the way, no matter where I chop this off, that's just an approximation, whereas the square root of 3 is exact. See, if I chop this thing off too soon, I won't get exactly 3 for the answer. For example, suppose I chop this off over here, and I now square 1.7 that's going to come out to be 2.89, which is less than 3. And the reason for that is, is that 1.7 is smaller than the square root of 3. In other words, when I multiply 1.7 by itself, I expect that to be less than 3. In a similar way, 1.8 is more than this number, because this is only 1.73 something. If I put an 8 over here, that should be too big. So 1.8 squared, I, put that, I, I multiply that on my calculator, I get 3.24. What am I looking for? I'm looking for 3. So if I didn't have a square root key on my calculator, could I still work this way? I could square 1.7 and see that I get an answer that's too small. I can square 1.8 and see that I get an answer that's too big. Since 1.7 is too small and 1.8 is too big, I know that the number I'm looking for has to be more than 1.7 but less than 1.8. So I'll just take another guess. I'll try 1.73. If I square it and the result is too big, I'll try something smaller. If it's too small, I'll try something bigger. So I square this, 1.73, I get 2.9929. That's still too small, but isn't that pretty close? To two decimal place accuracy, it's correct. I guess, not, I guess it would be 2.99. If we round this off, if we round this off to the nearest whole number, or even to the nearest tenth, that would be three. What if I try 1.74? I square that, I get something that's too big. I can keep on going like this by trial and error, 1.73205, I put that into my calculator, square it, I get 2.9999972203, but if I put in 1.73206 and square it, I get 3.0000. Look how close both of these numbers are to 3. And for most rounding off purposes, this is way closer than I'll ever need. But there are a couple of notes I just want to remind you of again. That notice that in the same way that b times b is b squared, that negative b times negative b is also b squared. So what you have to be very, very careful about is if I say the square root of 4, what does that usually mean? The square root of 4 means what? This is tricky. We usually say what? The number which, when multiplied by itself, gives you 4. Well, actually, we should be really saying what? The numbers, because it could be either what? Positive 2 or negative 2. See, positive 2 times positive 2 would give you 4, and negative 2 times negative 2 would give you 4. See, this leads to some very dangerous situations. For example, suppose I start with, uh, with 2. Let's uh, suppose I start with 3, and I square it. Now the answer is 9, right? Suppose I start with negative 3, and I square it. The answer is also 9. But suppose I say, let me on the calculator just find the square root of 9 that would give me 3, it would be wrong to infer that if the square of a number was 9, the number would have to be 3, because it could also have been what? Negative 3. I'll show you what that means in, the, in, a graph in, in, term, in terms of a graph in a minute. But what we do is, is we make an agreement. Since we don't want to have two outputs for the same input, the agreement that we make is that unless you write a positive and negative sign over here, the square root will always mean what? The positive square root. In other words, when I write down the square root of 16, what number am I going to mean? 4. If I want negative 4, I'll do what? I'll write negative. 
square root of 16. And if I wanted to list both of them, I'll write positive negative square root of 16, and that means the answer can be either what? Uh, plus or minus 4. See, but, but what you're saying is uh, uh, that, that basically we don't want one input to have two different outputs. You see, what, what we'd like to feel in this course is, to see, here's my graph. We'd like to feel that if I pick a particular input, which I'll call x, and I draw a vertical line like this, it will only meet the curve in one place. See, something like this. What I'm going to be nervous about is what if this thing doubles back, and now the line goes like this. Now the question is, do I mean this point, or do I mean this point? For example, suppose this is 2. This point starts with 2. This point starts with 2. This is some positive number here, some negative number over here. See, what I'd like to do is to be able to just worry about part of this. And what we usually do is, wherever the curve doubles back, what we usually will do is break it down. What we'll do is, is we'll look at this curve as two parts. This part over here will be one part. And this part over here will be the other part. Now look what happens. Now when you say, where does this line meet the curve? It meets this curve only at this point, And it meets this curve only at this point. And then when I want to study the whole thing as a whole, I just join these two pieces. That's called the union of these two pieces. In other words, if I call the top curve C1, and I call the bottom curve C2, I can write that the curve itself is the union, it looks like a U, of C1 and C2. That means I join these two. Now what happens is, even though this line hits this curve in two places, one of the places is on C1, and one of them is on C2. In other words, these are called single-valued branches of the curve, meaning what? Even though there's two answers, one of the answers belongs to this branch, one of the answers belongs to this branch, and I can therefore study both branches separately. Let's see how that applies to y equals the square root of x. See, for example, what number multiplied by itself will give you 0? Well, that's only 0. What number multiplied by itself will give you 1? Well, either 1 or negative 1. So we get this is 1, this is negative 1. What number multiplied by itself gives you 4? Either 2 or negative 2. What number multiplied by itself gives you 9? either 3 or negative 3. See what's happening over here? This green line, or whatever color it looks like on your monitor, intersects this curve in two places. But do you notice that one of these curves is the positive square root? I've written that in black. And the other curve is the negative square root, which I've written in red. Now what I'm saying is, if I just look at the black, at the black branch, where, where does this line cut the black branch? Only up here. The one down here is on the red branch. So what I do is, is I call the black branch the positive square root of x. y equals the positive square root. That's the one above the axis. The red one is called y equals the negative square root. And if I put both of these together, in other words, if I join them, if, if I form the union of c1 and c2, then I get the whole thing. But the point is what? If I want to study this thing without being obscured by one input giving me two outputs, all I have to do is what? study either one of these two branches, and whichever one I pick, put a mirror down on the x-axis, and the mirror image will tell me about the other branch. In other words, when we say, let's, let's assume that the square root of x means the positive square root of x, we are not throwing any information away. What we're saying is, knowing how this works, the mirror image will tell us how the negative uh, square root of x works, and by taking the union of these two, we see the whole picture all at once. So, in other words, uh, let me just show you what we've been driving at through all of this. What we're really saying is that we've been studying inverse functions all along, and all I want to point out is what? If the operation says to square something, the inverse operation is to take the square root. Okay? And what square root does it mean? It always means the positive one because you don't want a negative number inside here either. But the point, again, that I'm driving at is if you notice that the inverse of the inverse brings you back again. In other words, the inverse of squaring is taking the square root. The inverse of taking the square root is squaring. Again, the only thing I want to make sure you keep conscious of is the idea of single-valued branches, you see. In other words, if I tell you that the square of a number is 25, that number could be 5 or it could be negative 5. But if I say the positive square root, it means what? 
the 5. If I say negative the square root, it means minus 5. Okay? And that's all we're trying to point out over here. So let's make one more agreement, and we'll just see whether we have time to, to do all of this. Uh, if I write f of x squared, what that's going to mean is if there are no grouping symbols, it means that the 2 is modifying only the factor that comes immediately to the left. If, if I put no other grouping symbols in here, it's understood to be written like this. So if I say solve the equation 4x squared equals 400, it means this. And how am I going to do this? I want to isolate the parentheses. The 4 is multiplying the parentheses. To undo multiplying by 4, I'm going to divide by 4. That tells me x squared is 100. Now I want to undo squaring, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take the square, square root. But if I take the square root on one side, I also have to take the square root on the other side, so that will tell me x equals 10. Notice that 10 squared is 100. 100 times 4 is 400. But technically speaking, what I really want is what? I want the plus or minus. So in other words, x is not only 10, it's also equal to what? Negative 10. See, if I square negative 10, what do I get over here? Negative 10 times negative 10 is 100, times 4 is 400. Now, if I wanted the 4 to be squared also, I would have to do what? Put the 4x in parentheses. So that tells me that what? Everything inside the parentheses is being squared. Now when I do this problem, I do what? I take the square root of both sides. See, undo, see taking the square root cancels the square. That just leaves me with the 4x. The square root of 400 is 20, because 20 times 20 is 400. And that gives me what? That, that gives me 5. See, if 4x is 20, x will be 5. Just divide both sides by 4. And again, if you want to look at this more rigorously, and you want everything that solves this equation, you have to also throw in what? The plus or the minus. In other words, you don't want just the positive square root. You also want the negative square root. But that, again, is no major issue, because in many times, uh, the positive square root is the only one that's going to make sense anyway. Let's close, say, with one application. An object falls d feet in t seconds according to the rule d equals 16t squared. A says, how long does it take for the object to fall 144 feet? Part B says, how long does it take for the object to fall 200 feet? And the idea is simply like this. We have the formula. Part A says what? How long does it take for the object to fall 144 feet? Okay. And so all we do over here is what? We replace d by 144. Now, since there are no parentheses here, the 2 is modifying only the t. So it's the same as if we wrote it 16 multiplying t squared in parentheses. To unblock the parentheses, we have to divide both sides by 16. 144 divided by 16 is 9. OK, so we get what? t squared is equal to 9. And now if t squared is 9, what's t going to be? Well, technically speaking, it's going to be plus or minus 3, but positive or negative 3. But this formula doesn't apply, doesn't apply until you drop the object. See, t equals negative 3 refers to what? 3 seconds before you've dropped it. If you're dropping this when the time is 0, the only possible answer here is 3 seconds. Part B says, how long would it take the object to fall 200 feet? Well, it reminds me of the NFL football player who said his objective for the year was going to be to gain either 1,000 yards rushing or 2,000 yards rushing, whichever one came first. In other words, it can't fall 200 feet till it falls 144 feet. So obviously, since it takes three seconds to fall 144 feet, it's going to take longer than three seconds to fall 200 feet. How do we find the answer exactly? The recipe works exactly the same way. What we do is we want to isolate the t squared. That means we want to get rid of the 16. To get rid of multiplying by 16, we divide by 16. So, so far, t squared would be 200 over 16. We don't want t squared. We want t by itself. How do you undo? In other words, what's the inverse of squaring? It's taking the square root. So the answer is going to be what? The square root of 200 over 16. By the way, that's an exact answer. If you have a calculator, what do you do? You take the 200. You divide that by 16. Hit the equal key, all right? Then hit the square root key. And this tells you that it's what? A little bit more than three and a half seconds. What's the exact amount of time? The square root of 200 over 16. By the way, the mathematician prefers not to work that way. What the mathematician says, who cares whether this is 144, whether it's 200, whether it's 5,000? Let's just call it D. 
And what we want to do is now do what? Here, the conducive recipe is starting with T, find D. We want to know what happens if somebody gives you the value of D, what will T look like? So what we do is, generically, what we did before. We want to isolate the T squared, so we divide both sides by 16. That tells me T squared is D over 16. Now I take the square root of both sides to undo squaring. See what I'm saying? If I do the square and the square root, that cancels. So T would now be what? The square root of D over 16. What that says is, if you start with D here, don't go through this every single time. If you start with D, what keystrokes are you going to use on the calculator? Start with D, divide by 16, then press the square root, and that will give you the value of T, rather than to have to go through this procedure every single time. And the key point, just as we said when we're dealing with Fahrenheit and Celsius, D equals 16 T squared, and T equals the square root of D over 16 are two ways of saying exactly the same thing. The only difference is what? That you use this one when you know T and you want to find D. You use this one when you know D and you want to find T. And by the way, if you want to do this stuff graphically, uh, there isn't that much to this that you may want to look at. But what we're saying is what? See, but let's make a graph of where the object is at a given time. See, when the distance is 0, the time is 0. One second later, it's fallen 16 feet. At the end of two seconds, it's fallen 64. At the end of three seconds, 144. And you see what's happening over here? In a given time interval, the distance that the object falls becomes greater and greater. And graphically, this is all we show. By the way, what some people prefer to do, and we'll close with this, is rather than put two variables on the same graph, they'll plot one of the variables horizontally and the other one vertically. In other words, what people might do is they would let the time be horizontal and the distance be vertical. So when the time is one second, the distance was 16 feet. When the time was two seconds, the distance was 64 feet. When the time was three seconds, the distance was 144 feet. Now, once you have this curve drawn, and somebody says, how long does it take for this object to fall 110 feet? One way to do it, of course, is by the algebra. Just replace d by 110 and use that formula that we used before. The other way to do it is what? If this graph is drawn accurately, locate the 110, go over here to the curve, and then project down here. And that would tell you right away that the answer is somewhere between 2 and 3 and closer to 3. And if you needed something more accurate than that, you could use this. And anyway, I can tell by the big hand on the clock that the time is just about up for this particular segment. And I'm hoping you're starting to see the whole picture here, how, technically speaking, all of this advanced notation and the like is just a refinement of things that we've done before. And as we get further and further into the subject, we simply make more and more refinements. But all of it goes back to the same basic things that we did in the first few lessons. And we're going to start a different part, uh, s some different topics for the second half of the course. But for now, just maybe review what we've done so far. Make sure you understand everything. Enjoy, study hard, stay young. See you next time. Thank you.